For over 200 years, Japan prospered as a feudal society under the authoritarian rule of the Tokugawa shogunate. The emperors of Japan still held influence as divine heads of state, but physical power was in the hands of the shoguns, the military rulers of the country. At the beginning of their reign, the shoguns had imposed the policy of Sakoku, or closed country, which, under the penalty of death, prohibited foreigners from visiting Japan and any Japanese from leaving the country. Having done so, the indigenous Japanese culture flourished, untouched by foreign influence. However, the 19th century would be the theatre of events that would force the land of the rising sun to either modernise or perish into history. I'm your host Vincent and welcome to Caspian Report. Feel free to visit my channel History of China if you want to see more of my content. Link will be in the description. In the first half of the 19th century, social tensions within the Japanese society intensified as economic prosperity declined under the Tokugawa shogunate. The living condition had depreciated so severely that numerous famines, known as the Tenpo Famines, led to tens of thousands of deaths. The Tokugawa government failed to address any of these issues. As such, several provinces orchestrated their own reforms, even raising their own small forces to quell local revolts. On the social aspect, a new nationalist academic movement, known as the Kokugaku, or National Study, praised the Shinto religion while rejecting the shogunate's neo-Confucianist ideology. Since the Emperor of Japan was the head of the Shinto faith, most followers of the Kokugaku philosophy supported the restoration of his political power. Internationally, Western powers already had a strong presence in the region, being in the process of colonizing China. Goods from East Asian states were in high demand at the time, and after bringing an end to the Chinese Canton trade system through the Opium War, the empires of the West sought to open up Japan forcefully. In 1852, the Americans took the initiative when a fleet of gunboats led by Commodore Matthew Perry set sail to Japan. After arriving in Edo Bay in 1853, Blank shots were fired to intimidate the Japanese. It was gunboat diplomacy at its finest, and negotiations began soon afterwards. But sure enough, as soon as Japan's vulnerability was exposed, the Russians, British and French joined the colonization frenzy. Much like the Western imposed terms and treaties in China, several agreements were signed with the Japanese leadership that granted Americans and Europeans significant advantages in trade. In the eyes of the Japanese public, Western infringement was yet another demonstration of the shogunate's inefficiency. The traditionalist domains of Satsuma and Choshu sided with the nationalist xenophobic Kokugaku movement and embellished the slogan, Son no joy, revere the emperor, expel the barbarians. Yet, despite condemning the West as barbaric, the leaders of Satsuma and Choshu favoured Western weapons and equipped themselves accordingly. The two domains eventually ended up forming an alliance known as the Satcho, the melding of Satsuma and Choshu. A large contingent of Satcho troops was stationed in the imperial capital, Kyoto. The Satcho used this opportunity to reach out to the 13-year-old Emperor Meiji, influencing him to overthrow the Shogun. In 1866, the new Shogun, Tokugawa Yoshinobu, attempted to reform and rebuild the country. He invited the French to modernize his army and the British to upgrade his navy. However, it was too little too late. With every passing day, Yoshinobu lost authority and power across Japan, until he threw in the towel and formally resigned to Emperor Meiji in November 1867. When the most radical pro-emperor figures attempted to arrest Yoshinobu and confiscate all his properties and possessions, the former shogun went to plea to the imperial court. When he arrived in Kyoto, Yoshinobu was being escorted by a large shogunate contingent. He was refused entry by the Satcho troops. As tensions mounted, the Imperial and Shogunate forces exchanged fire. This series of unfortunate events ignited a civil conflict known as the Boshin War. It wasn't a protracted conflict though. After several months of fighting, the Shogunate forces were defeated and the Meiji Emperor took effective power. As a result, in October 1868, the modern state of Japan came into existence. Immediately following the conclusion of the Boshin War, the Imperial Court was relocated to Edo and the city was renamed Tokyo. A new capital for the new state and the Meiji government would need it, for it planned to modernize the country from the ground up. The first act of the Emperor Meiji and his council was to repeal the old laws. For example, the Neo-Confucian state ideology was overturned and Christianity, long banned, was legalized. Meanwhile, feudal domains, 
traditionally ruled by the daimyos, now became prefectures administered by civil servants who reported to the imperial court. Still more, the traditional nobility was redesigned according to European standards. The Meiji oligarchs understood that what made the Western powers strong was their industry and infrastructure. Consequently, railways and telegraph offices were built all over Japan with the help of British entrepreneurs. Dozens of foreign advisors were further hired, a policy known as the Oyatoi Gaikokujin. With the aid of Western technocrats, the Japanese developed modern institutions and industries. At the same time, a universal education system was set up, promoting a robust nationalist ideology. Japan was still weak compared to the West, but the momentum for the Japanese Renaissance was set. The government understood that relying on foreign advisors for expertise was only a temporary solution. So, it sent hundreds of young Japanese students, called Ryugakusei, to Russia, France, Britain and the Netherlands to learn the basics of modern technology and science. As they returned, the Ryugakusei were installed at the highest government posts, allowing them to effectively apply their newfound knowledge. However, all was not serene in Japan, and the reforms were confronted with opposition from traditionalist factions. Modern Japan was no longer a place for the samurai, in 1871, the emperor severely cut down their salary. As a result, several traditionalists banded together and launched samurai rebellions. Nonetheless, they were systematically crushed by the modernizing Imperial Japanese Army. Unlike the samurai, any able man could now enlist in the military, and conscription was introduced in 1873 for all males turning 21 years old. To parallel Western empires, Japan steadily expanded its sovereignty over new territories the Ryukyu Kingdom on the Ryukyu Archipelago was annexed in 1875 and became the Okinawa Prefecture. Plans also began to be made for a conquest of overseas Korea. A decade into the Meiji Renaissance, Japan, which by then had declared itself an empire, saw substantial economic growth. State-owned enterprises thrived, financed by the government's newly created Bank of Japan, while newly constructed shipyards, iron smelters, and spinning mills were privatized, bringing steady income to the state and allowing entrepreneurs to continue building up Japanese industries. Small traditional crafts workshops were now replaced with large factories producing goods at previously unconceivable rates. As prosperity increased nationwide, political sciences also flourished. New political parties began to emerge and an official constitution was adopted in 1889 providing Japan with an elected house. It wasn't a democracy in the modern context though, as only 5% of the male population had the right to vote, while women were wholly excluded from the process. Nevertheless, in approximately 30 years, Japan had grown from an agricultural feudal society to a fully modernized industrial nation. By 1894, Japan was ready to put its newly acquired power to the test. As Japanese forces landed in the Korean peninsula with the pretext to protect interests, which at the time was a vassal state to China, the government in Beijing delivered an ultimatum to Tokyo to withdraw its forces from Korea. Japan refused to comply, and bitter hostilities erupted. To the surprise of the world, Japan decisively defeated China in only a few months, allowing Tokyo to dictate the terms of the surrender. Under the conditions of the peace treaty, Korea officially became a protectorate of Japan who further received the nearby Liaodong Peninsula, already coveted by Russia, and the island of Taiwan, and large sums of silver. The victory over China distinguished Japan's ambitious rise to regional hegemony in the eyes of the Western powers. China's millennial reputation as the greatest nation in East Asia was at an end. The humiliating defeat to Japan, as well as general discontent within the population, led bands of Chinese peasants to launch the Boxer Rebellion, against Qing authorities in 1899. When the Boxer rebels attacked foreign legations and embassies in Beijing, the foreign powers got together in the Eight Nation Alliance in which Japan took part. The rebellion was crushed and the Qing Empire was forced to pay reparations to the victors. However, in the 19th century, being a modern nation also meant having an empire. By crushing China and subjugating Korea, the Japanese had set themselves apart from their Asian neighbors. But to stand shoulder to shoulder with European powers, one had to beat a European empire. The occasion for this came in 1904, after an escalation of tensions between the Empire of Japan and the Empire of Russia concerning control and influence in the Manchurian region, 
the Russo-Japanese War broke out. Within only a year, the fully modernized Japan Empire defeated the Russians. With that victory, the Empire of the Rising Sun had officially joined the ranks of the world's imperial powers. After a life devoted to his country, Emperor Meiji died on the 29th of July 1912. He had ruled the country for 45 years, and in that time transformed the fabric of society. In this remarkable historical chapter, Emperor Meiji turned Japan from an isolationist feudal state into an industrialized world power. After his funeral, the New York Times wrote about the reign of Meiji, the contrast between that which preceded the funeral car and that which followed it was striking indeed. Before it went old Japan, after it came new Japan. The new modernized Japan served as a source of pride for many Japanese, but the sense of entitlement would also result in Japan's destructive quest for an empire in the following century. I've been your host Vincent from Caspian Report. If you want to see more of my videos, feel free to check out my channel, History of China, link in the description below. For now, thank you for your time, and au revoir.